Okay, so I'm alright, my shirt's alright, my hair's alright, I'm, I'm not sweating till I've got too much bleed on me. Looking good. You're all set. Okay, well. What's it? Okay, good. Are we wired for sound? We're wired, baby. All set. Okay. Okay, well, here we go. Hello. Hello. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. And you. Talk Hello. about, first of all, being back in Los Angeles. This has kind of been your home away from home. Largo. Largo is very much, yes, yes. Uh, LA transformed for me when I discovered Largo. Um, Grant Lee Phillips took me here one night, uh, not long after Flanagan had had it. Well, he'd done something to it. I don't know what. But, uh, no, no, I've been coming here all the time. I never play anywhere else now except Largo. I remember seeing you at various clubs for years and years and years, but I don't exist anymore. Well, probably places like the lingerie. Mm -hmm. I guess that's gone. Alligator Lounge in Santa Monica once, I remember correctly, just one time. I was trying to remember where it was. Yeah, you're right. right okay, yeah, yeah, that's gone. Yeah. And talk about what's special about this place for you as an artist when you come here that works well for you. Well, I think the main thing about Largo is Flanagan, really. Um, and if you don't know what Flanagan is, it's hard to sort of really explain to your to your viewers um, but Flanagan is the sort of pulsing sentient all seeing heart and eye of Largo um, he's just over up there somewhere yeah. and, uh, I noticed that whenever I whenever I get to town he knows when I'm coming he always knows what you're doing before you tell him he tells you where everyone else you know is mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, people who are trying to get hold of him from the outside, like record companies and publicists and stuff like that, he's absolutely impossible for them to find. Um, you know, there are the conventional ways of finding people, like cell phones and um, emails and things. And, and yes, he has them in a way, but whereas most people are absolutely desperate, to be accessible at all times of day or night. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, most people will have three phones and they all have call waiting and there's no reason why anybody can't get through to them. You know, people are desperate to be contacted. Flanagan, although he's, his life is other people, uh, is quite elusive. You know, it's like having to, to, if you want to get hold of a hedgehog, and do you all have hedgehogs here? Or, um, raccoons or something, you know. You have to lure it, the hedgehog out by putting a little saucer of milk down somewhere, you know, when it gets dark. And then you go indoors, and then in the morning you find the hedgehog has snuck out and had the milk. It's the same with Flanagan. You have to leave a message somewhere discreet, and then one of his people will get back to you. You can't just, you know, get me Flanagan on the cell phone. You know, it doesn't happen. You could probably get hold of Martin Scorsese, but you can't get hold of Flanagan. Sure, sure. That begs the question, how accessible... Are you at this point in your career? You're living back in New London. You were living in the States for a little while. Not that you were any more accessible there, but in terms of dealing with, in terms of dealing with record labels cell phones. and career and things like that. Well, most people can find me if they want to. What I don't have is a manager. I've never evolved that relationship. I've had managers, but it hasn't worked. Um, and so. What I have instead is a thing called the Museum of Robin Hitchcock, which is run by David Greenberg, who also does the Duke Bell's Planet. Mm -hmm. Writes for NPR and all sorts of stuff. Um, David very kindly runs my museum and website. So people use that as a post restaurant. You know, they try and get in touch with me via him. Um, but I haven't got, you know, the Robin Hitchcock shop, and I'm sort of sitting there open for business. Right. <laughs> So, but it's always the same with everything. You've got to get all your different different cells to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. There was that marvelous bit when a space, I think it was going, it was a, one of the Martian probes. Uh, it was coming into land, and they realized that they hadn't sorted out whether they were calibrating in feet or centimeters. So the thing just crashed. Uh, you know, so no one is immune to interdepartmental screw ups. <laughs> Talk about how unique this is, the dates you're doing here in town now, these all requests. 
Mm. So how much fun that's been so far? Well, I've only done one night, but it was really good fun. I mean, the, the thing is, when you when you have as long a, a, a repertoire as I do, um, you tend to fall back on the most reliable songs to play. So although I've probably recorded over 350 songs now, um, I've written probably twice that many. At any one given time, I would probably only be able to play about 30 of them because they're the regular ones I know work. Mm -hmm. So um, I started asking people, because when people shout out requests, they usually all shout out at once, so I can't make out what they're saying. It's just like a sort of tangled ball of words. You can't get it. Or they request songs I've forgotten how to play. So I, people have been emailing in to David saying, um, you know, please will you play whatever, you know, a skull, a suitcase, a long red bottle of wine in mm -hmm. Brooklyn on, you know, whatever it is, right. November the 10th. And I'll, I will then consider doing that. I won't guarantee everything considered, nothing guaranteed. But it means that it makes me reinvestigate my old back catalogue. And sometimes there are a few songs that I didn't play, and I'm surprised that they were. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think because I've seen Dylan sort of massacre his back catalogue uh, for reasons of his own, I kind of, I really try and make the best of this, one of my old songs, if I can. Mm -hmm. Or an old Dylan song, for that matter. Uh, but I wouldn't try and play anything that didn't mean anything to me, just because I thought people liked it. So, um, but they're all there. Yeah. Plus, you know, I mean, I'm the person who's going to be doing them. It's not that there's hundreds of people out there doing Robin Hitchcock right. cover acts. I trust. <laughs> How important is just the nature of the technical challenge for yourself at this point in your career? Is that something that that then that's part of what you're doing, just to have an exciting week when something Oh yeah, well, it's an excuse to play three nights at Largo. And I know that also the same people will come along to all three gigs. <laughs> Not exactly the same hundred people every night, but a fair number. So it's fun for them if I don't play exactly the same stuff. Right. So, if they're going to spend $45 on three nights worth of Robin Hitchcock, and the least I could do is give them three separate nights. Mm -hmm. And there it keeps me interested too. Yeah. Any songs you're always going to play, and any songs you're always not going to play when you look at your catalog? <laughs> I'm always not going to play. Um, I think, well, some things I couldn't play on my own, you know, like The Man with the Light Bulb Head. But what I have done is, I mean, I believe The Man with the Light Bulb Head, that record of Pegmania is out of print, but what I have done is I've re released the t shirt. So you can now buy a man with the light bulb head T-shirt from uh, the Museum of Robin Hitchcock or at a gig if there happens to be one of those. Mm -hmm. Some old songs I don't, you know, some of them haven't lasted, but there's some of the sort of psycho pop ones, I think. Um, maybe I've sort of grown out of that a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yet if those are coming through, like Matt on their, on their request wire, Probably, probably. Yeah. I mean, I think there's that. I've probably shifted a fair bit from what I seem to be 20 years ago, mm -hmm. because I think I think my emotional palette has probably broadened a bit. So um, only a bit. I mean, I was writing quite reflective, sad songs back 20 years ago or more, but. People latched onto the kind of goofy, um, the sort of you know, bright autistic child sort of songs, mm -hmm. and you know some of them were pretty smart. But I'm probably more, I'm probably a more of a reflective songwriter than most people think of me, because what attracted attention was the more. Uh, kind of lurid images, you know, the man with the light bulb head and Sandra's having her brain out and sometimes I wish I was a pretty girl and that um, that sort of side of stuff. Sure. And but I also had stuff like Autumn is your last chance and Chinese bones. Um, and, um, you know, uh, oh thank you. And so um, 
I, I don't know. I mean, I think the most recent record is obviously sort of full of reflective stuff. But I mean, probably so with the last <laughs> the last five albums I've right. made. Yeah. Uh, I noticed the most common review tag with me is, "Gee, Hitchcock's growing up, and he seems to be more sincere and uh, re reflective than he was." And they've been saying that for about fifteen years right, as right. well. You know, so. We'll talk about the new album, and we we'll talk about how that's worked into your show too. If you don't get any requests for a spoof to get that as your new album, if you feel compelled to promote that as well as part of oh, the Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I'm not. These songs won't all be requests. Okay. I've I've written down the the songs that people have requested, and then I've also written in songs I want to play. Sure. Um, people do request stuff off Spooked, actually, yeah. which is nice. They request stuff off Spooked and Luxor and some of the more recent things, as well as just going back to um, uh, Fake Mania or or the Soft Boys. Yeah. But the thing is that because I've been going so long, there are so many distinct periods. We had that Soft Boys reunion a few years ago, and we could comfortably have played no songs written in 1980. You know. um, I could likewise quite happily tour and I could play nothing written after 1990. I could just go up to the sort of, you know, even before the end of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So there's all these, there's different phases that people, that resonate with people, especially the older fans, because they just remind them of being younger. And it's, you know, the same for me. In the end, the songs always become sort of time capsules. Mm -hmm. You're transported back, whether you're the singer or the listener, to when you first heard them. And half of the function of these things is not really to act as a new emotional stimulus, but to um, just send people back to where they were, you know, when Elvis died or when Lennon was shot or when they had their first orgasm or uh, the first time they had three egg omelet. And the first time they were kissed in a parking lot, or the first time they had to get rid of a moth, and um, all these different elements in your life, you know, or just seeing leaves fall. And, and songs do that They're because the songs, because music seems to be the most emotional, immediately emotional of the art forms. Music really grabs people and takes them through time. And apparently, so does smell. But it's really hard to do a public performance of smell. <laughs> Talk about where you were when you when you put Spook together. That's already behind you and it's out there. Where were you at the time? If you can put the words on that on top. Spook was um, Spook was very much a, a, a lucky accident. As I ran into Gillian Welch and David Rawlings, and having been having become fans of theirs, because my wife Michelle gave me a hell among the Unions for my birthday a couple of years ago. I don't listen, I don't get grabbed by a great deal of music these days. I just, I think I sort of saturated when I was about 40 and not much actually makes it right into the hypothalamus. But I really liked some of their stuff and so we went to see them and it turned out that they used to come and see me when they were in college. Uh, when Gil was a little floppy groover in Santa Cruz and, um, and Dave was a sort of bippy music student. Berkeley. Apparently, I signed Dave's guitar to him in the store. And um, so I met them, I, you know, having become a fan, and they were fans of mine when they were kids. So uh, David gave me a fistful of phone numbers and, and said, you know, come and have a go in our studio. And as luck would have it, I had a round trip, high grade flight from New York to London, you know, round trip, because I was I had a small part in the Manchurian candidate. So there I was, uh, and I had a, went down to Nashville for what would have been the weekend, and then Jonathan and Demi's people said, no, no, we don't need you this week, you'll never meet Meryl Streep, kid, and stay in Nashville. So I had six days, so instead of meeting Meryl, Meryl Streep, or indeed Meryl Streep, um, I, uh, we did spooks and we got the basic thing done in six days. We just, we just got on very well. I suspect we got a lot of the same records in our collection. I mean, Gil and Dave and me, not Meryl Streep. And, uh, and I don't know what DZ listens to. I don't know, but, but um, it was all, it was lovely. It was just, it was like a really good dream. And I've had comparatively few good dreams. <laughs> you know, I've had some lucky breaks and I've, 
I suppose I've been lucky just to have lasted this long really without contracting some horrendous illness, touch Largo chair or you know, falling out of the sky. Um, so you know, in some ways your whole life is a constant lucky break that you don't realise until it's over. But, uh, but this was a really good one, I couldn't believe it, all those circumstances coming together and, um, and you know, leaving us with spook. Talk about being a lucky break. Talk about in terms of your consciousness, in terms of here in the states that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. When you, there was a while you were kind of turned to cult figure, and then the kind of final line between that and becoming kind of a legend. People kind of refer to you in, your, in a lot of circles, and there's such admiration for for your career and what you've done. How much? Like, when were you aware, maybe, of some of that in terms of what people say about you and, and how that translated to? Well, I think there's always been an element of people liking what I've done. Really, back, you know, since. For, for 20 years or more, because um, we were always comparatively obscure in Britain, and so nobody knew really whether I, and indeed the soft boys, existed or not. There wasn't anything about us in the papers because we were kind of under radar the way we were operating, and we didn't have the right kind of plumage to attract the, the NME people and stuff. Um, we had a sort of 60s look and attitude at a time when that was not vogue. But um, Nonetheless, it all kind of, we sold a few records and wondered where we'd sold them because they didn't seem to be in the shops in Britain. Turns out they'd all been imported into Georgia. Um, so I and the posthumous soft boys became a sort of cult and spreading up from the south and born on the wings of REM. Um, and by the time we started coming over, I and, and the Egyptians started coming over in the mid 80s, there was already what you'd call a cult. I think that there was a bit of confusion in the late 80s because we got latched onto by A&M and, and the sort of music business that thought the whole thing could be something much bigger. And I'm not sure how helpful that was in the end. I think it probably overexposed some of the wrong elements of what we were about. I don't know. Who knows? But it got us on the radio, so probably no people heard it. It doesn't. I don't think that what I do ever encapsulated into singles, so, so that the singles that were on the radio weren't necessarily my best songs or what I was about. Um, whereas, I don't know, say something like The Ghost in You by the Psychedelic Third, which I always loved, or More Than This by Roxy Music, they were the, probably the strongest tracks on the record. They were at the front of the record, and they were the ones that got all the airplay. But I wouldn't say Balloon Man or So You Think You're Love were necessarily the best Robin Hitchcock songs. Um, they're almost like little, you know, parodies in some ways. They're not bad, but they're um, not my best work. You see what I mean? So maybe that element was rather overexposed. And, but that's it. Some people encapsulate well. I, for instance, I think I look pretty good in, in film. I, uh, but I don't take very well in photographs. I've got quite a liquid face yeah. and, and it doesn't necessarily catch in in pictures. And some people encapsulate well in a, uh, you know, in what used to be a 45 in a single and other people, you've really got to listen to the whole album to get what they're about. And I'm afraid you probably have to do that with me. You have to, you have to actually take the time to listen to the whole 40 minutes worth of it and then it'll work. And it's, it's not easy to sell something that that takes that long to uh, to download. People don't have the patience. They want something they can get what it is in three minutes and, and get what it is in three sentences and then bang, you know. I'm assuming at this point in your career you kind of come to terms with all that stuff and you're doing what you want to do. And well, I pretty much always have. Yeah. The only concessions I've made haven't been in the material I've played, but simply in the way it was recorded. So. Generally speaking, my success has been in inverse proportion to the amount of money spent on the records. <laughs> the ones with the money spent on them all rather tend to sound like Perspex Island and Groovy Decay all have sort of state-of-the-art 80s drum sounds and sound rather dated now. Um, the ones I produced myself very cheaply don't really belong in any particular time. Sometimes you can tell, like, the engineer will chorus the guitars, and you go, oh, it must have been the mid-80s when, you, you know, and then you notice it's not there anymore. But, 
but I mean I've been I've been lucky in that I've actually done exactly what I've wanted to do um, like that moth that obviously has taken shine to you but, yeah <laughs> to put him on the door um, so yeah I mean that's uh, that, that side of it I really can't complain about mm -hmm. You've been relatively prolific. What, if you can just put the words, what you're, I'm just assuming you're someone who's probably always writing and you're always doing things to create a mm. probably a million songs and no one ever gets to hear. What, mm. what do you, when you're not doing this, are you always writing, are you always performing, always playing, always painting, you're always doing something creative? I like to be. I mean, that's what comes naturally to me. Obviously, as a self employed artist, I spend a lot of time in administration, so actually, a lot of my time is spent on the phone doing emails. Um, or wandering back and forth to the high street with the, with the groceries. But, uh, yeah, I would, I basically, I spend most of the time playing the guitar or, or I'd be painting or, or something if I can't. If the music doesn't come, um, at this stage I kind of, I get, I get reservoirs of nothing when, when no songs seem to come through for nine months. I always get rather despondent and sort of menopausal and think, Jesus, that's it, I'm going to quit this business, you know. But actually, uh, songs are like cats, you know, they will come padding up to you if you let them take their own time. Or, or like fish, you know, you can't force a fish to be caught, you have to lure it. I always think they're somewhere between the cats and fish. Or you could even say they were like birds and they'll come and land on you if you need some nice food for them. Just watch they don't peck your eyes out. Uh, and I think that one of the one of the lures of songwriting is waiting to see what comes next. Because it is I don't know what the expression is, like a lucky dip in Britain might be a grab bag here, but you you don't know what what is going to come along. You might say, well, damn it, I want to write a song about Dick Cheney and Condoleezza Rice because these people are, are upsetting me in some way. But you can't, you can, you, you know, it doesn't work like that. The song has to come to you. You know, and actually it might, the song might come, it might be, you know, Condi is my baby, Lord, she is so sweet. Uh, Old Dick Cheney is my man, I love him head to feet. And that's, you know, what's that going to do for you? Hi, <laughs> Dick, hi, Condi. So, um, she's a musician, Scorpio to boot. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think Dick has a son. But, you know, I, I, while I have the public's ear, you, yeah. you can cut this one out, but there are a few interesting things that are coming to light. One is that, have you ever seen Carl Rove in the Antarctic? No, you know why that is? Emperor penguins. <laughs> Carl Rove, his nemesis is the emperor penguin. Yeah. He can just about. I've seen photo shots where he's with an ordinary penguin, and an ordinary penguins. I thought, they were, you know, like an ordinary penguin was that big, but actually they're only about, about like that, twice the height of a pencil. You know, they get they get lost in a in a rush. The emperors come up to about here, and that's where Carl gets very jittery. Coins in his pocket shudder, his hands get clammy, and uh, he's off. Donny Rumsfeld, you will never see him at the end of the table with the bread. All the, the, the bread's up with the G men. And W has a very interesting phenomenon. He, he thinks he's being stalked by uh, Neil Diamond. <laughs> but the problem is, because of the frequency of the, the way W's mind works, sometimes it isn't. Diamond. It's Barry Manilow. <laughs> he just knows it's one of those two entertainers. And uh, you'll notice that when they get to DC, there's always a sort of big security free song. Um, and, I, you know, that kind of stuff, I don't know, it, it's becoming, slowly becoming part of urban myth. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, actually, Rumsfeld recently took a meeting with Aquaman, you know, from the Justice League of America. Aquaman was out on this, uh, he was acting independently of the Justice League here, but I think there's some friend of mine said, heaven help Atlantis. But, you know. So all this stuff is going on, like the whole thing with the land clans in you know, Manitoba, and whilst, you know, the, the lens of the world is being focused on Syria and places that they've never actually heard of, 
down south that they've said they want to bomb them. Um, all this stuff is going on. There's these 40 foot land clams um, just over the border in Manitoba. I mean, there's, I don't know, countless. I mean, they're just, you know, there's a lot of space there. They're massed on the Minnesota border as far as the eye can see. Do you see this in the papers? No. Oh, but there they are, big old land clams. They open up like that. They printed up in Winnipeg all these t-shirts that say, go clams. <laughs> and one day they will. But you know, I know that, that Secretary Rumsfeld and, and um, whatever Condi's role is, you know, they're very stum on these matters. <laughs> So, you know, thank you for giving me public air, air for no, this. No, I but, know. Uh, and you share wonderful insight like with your audience, because I know a lot of the time at that show. But it's only been recorded for a lot of time. Well, I, I have certain things. I mean, I, I have started telling them about the penguins. I haven't really, I haven't wanted to alarm them about the clowns. <laughs> I, I, the clowns, I noticed when I was in Winnipeg a couple of years ago, and I thought they were thinking it's a huge joke, you know. I mean, they're eight hours from Minneapolis and vice versa. I mean, God forbid that the little apple should be overwhelmed by these clams. I'm a big fan of Minneapolis, and I like the peg too. Yeah, I do. I talk to the audience and I tell them what's what's really going on because the misinformation that's happening is enormous. You know? Plus, after the election, everyone was so upset they were pleased to see me. Um, so, so anyway, that's that's the story. <laughs> Talk about because we hope maybe we'll get to them. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Your your friends. Uh, your friends in the business, people you collaborate with, like Grant. Mm. Well, that's another great thing about Largo, is that you get um, the opportunity to have, it's the only place I know where musicians actually sit in with each other. I mean, obviously the, the apotheosis of this is John Bryan's show on Friday, mm -hmm. and he'll often have two or three guests up. Um, one memorable night, he had Lisa Germano come on, just left her by herself on stage. He said, I've all these loop tapes. He went back up and had a beer and she sang over something he'd manufactured. But I had, well, I had John last night and Winston Watson, drummer. Um, he used to play with Dylan in the 90s. I met him in the uh, And who else have we got? I've got Grant coming this evening. Um, who else is there? John Perry from The Only Ones is in town, so he's going to come and play tomorrow, I think. Um, I've never played with Amy Mann, but she turns up. Yeah. Well, she says she doesn't like to jam and do things she doesn't know about. But she was here with Michael last night. Um, one of your, uh, one of your I don't want to grant you, you around the back. Oh, you're stuck. Oh, I was on stage with Jack Black once. That's yeah. my claim to fame. Jack Black and Paul F. Tompkins. Paul F. had me up on comedy night, that was fun. Paul F. is brilliant, in fact, I don't know, where, I don't know if he's coming along tonight, but um, I, again, I just think it's Largo. I, I suppose, you know, Flanagan and, and then John. And Flanagan's the closest thing John has to a sort of manager, mm -hmm. even an address in some ways. You know, but they just run this operation. and. Um, and I mean, I've, I've got to Seattle a fair bit, and we've started having little hoots up there um, in a pub, sort of kind of inspired by here, really. Mm -hmm. And we've now got a pub in London that we do benefit gigs for mid south Sans Frontier. They send um, doctors into parts of the world that other doctors cannot reach. Although, sadly, they had to leave Afghanistan, but they, they just did a benefit for the four. For the AIDS campaign in Burma, the medicines of the AIDS education campaign in Burma. So we've raised about ten thousand pounds so far, which is great. And we have the house band, but actually, that's not Largo. That's that's back in England. But I mean, I would say that La it, it's that it's you know the spirit of Largo emanating. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I love it, and then it's just great to have three nights really. Yeah. And lastly, where are you now in terms of what you're writing, what you may be recording, what are we going to hear next? We're going to back to this interview, we'll see that for us. Uh, oh, well, uh, my cycle is that I'm now collecting songs for the next record. I'm not sure where it will be made, whether it will be made with one, uh, you know, under one roof and one producer like Spook was, which was just really luck, or whether it will be another one of those piecemeal records like Mosalixia. 
modules for Sophia where we would s I'd assemble things from different sessions. But, you know, I mean, I'd love to have any of them working on it. I'd love to do more with Gillian and David. I'd love to do some more. With I've actually got a record I started with John Bryan and Winston Watson in Tucson, but whether we'll ever finish it, I don't know. And um, I'd love to do some more with Scott McCoy and Peter Buck in Seattle. And I've got some friends in Britain as well. Um, so I'm, it's great. I'm really not short of musicians. <laughs> um, that's another way I've been really lucky, I guess. I've, I've become a sort of musician magnet. And I was going to say, the people are always getting requests and calls and emails from either friends or people that want to be part of what you do. Um, no, gently, you know, it's not like they're all hammering on the door saying, collaborate with me, Robin, yay, you know, here's my backing tracks or something like that. But, but I found out that generally, in some strange way, if I'm attracted to a sort of musician, I mean, to their music, uh, they usually seem to get along with mine. People I sort of admired, like Grant Lee and Tanya Donnelly, turned out to be people who were fans of mine, and, you know, Gil and Dave. Um, and John, I was actually brought down to Largo and physically introduced to by my former A&R man who said, I think you should try this guy, and he was dead right. <laughs> but, you know, that that's otherwise, I'm just great, you know, they sort of, you find people you think might, you might like, you like their stuff, and it turns out they, they all like yours, so, so that's terrific. That's the story so far. <laughs>